Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, uh, it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce uh, uh, Professor John Williams from uh, MIT. He's a um, professor of uh, information engineering there and uh, director of the uh, Auto ID Lab, amongst other many, uh, many interesting uh, 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 claims in his bio. So you should check that out. I hear that uh, he's got some, uh, got some dancing skills as well. So maybe <laughs> some of you would want to check that out. I'm here today. I'm Stuart Tansley. I'm representing uh, Paul Oka, um, who is uh, M Microsoft Research's uh, representative. In, uh, in, uh, at MIT, located in Boston. And, um, uh, but I also have interest in, uh, in the, uh, the, the fascinating work of uh, Professor Williams. So, John, over to you. Great. Thanks very much, Stuart. Um, as usual, it's, most of the work that I'm presenting is not mine. So uh, it's due to a lot of these, the students, you know, the really bright students that we get. So uh, what I'd like to talk a little bit about is that um, uh, we have this vision of building the Internet of Things. Uh, identifying things in the, in the physical world and uh, being able to find information about them. Um, in particular, I'm going to talk about uh, RFID in the supply chain. And what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about who we are in the Auto ID Labs. Um, I'll talk about what our vision, which is architecting this Internet of Things, and you know that's a bold vision. But uh, and I think Stuart uh, and, and you guys probably will uh, achieve far more than we will, but uh, we're, we're, we're trying our best to uh, move along that, uh, along that line. Um, I'll talk more about problems. Uh, we've got lots of problems um, that we haven't solved, and uh, I think some of them are interesting. Um, so, and then I'll talk a bit about what we're doing, uh, including building a simulator to test our ideas, and also looking at maybe some lightweight protocols uh, um, and standards to uh, communicate information. So the Auto ID Labs are a, a collection of seven labs that were spun out of the Auto ID Center in MIT. Um, the history was that um, some guys, uh, Kevin Ashton, uh, San, uh, Professor Sanjay Sharma, um, and David Brock set up uh, the Auto ID Center with the idea of having low-cost uh, RFID tags to replace barcodes so that you didn't need line of sight to uh, track things. Um, and their vision was the five cent tag. Um, the Auto ID Center was uh, very successful. They raised quite a lot of money, about 30 million, um, and put forward this vision uh, that things could be traced in the supply chain. And that this uh, um, vision of real-time data about where things were uh, would lead to cost savings in the supply chain. And in uh, 2000, um, the MIT realized that there was a need for standards, so what they did was close down the Auto ID Center and split it into two. So they, the standards part was pushed out to some, uh, a body called EPC Global that uh, um, is part of GS1. GS1 set uh, the, the standards uh, or managed the standards for barcodes uh, and the issuing of uh, what they call manager numbers. Um, and they set up EPC Global uh, with, that was to be responsible for setting the standards uh, for EPC electronic product codes um, that would be part of, uh, embedded in these tags. And the Auto ID Labs, uh, were in exchange for the IP rights, the Auto ID Labs were guaranteed a stream of money um, from EPC Global. And so seven labs uh, were set up. Um, we have uh, Alga Fleisch uh, in Switzerland, um, Duncan McFarlane in Cambridge, UK, uh, Hao Min in China, uh, in Fudan, China, uh, Sangug in South Korea, um, Peter Cole in Australia, and uh, Jun Murai in, in Japan. So these are our sister labs, and together we're, uh, we, we specialize in different areas. Some are specializing in hardware, uh, we're pretty much now specializing in software um, above, above the gateway, if you like. And so these passive RFID tags, so under our RFID, we've got active RFID tags and passive RFID tags. The passive ones lack uh, power and get their power from readers that broadcast out a, a signal. And these aerials are mainly to uh, kind of uh, to 
catch that power and power up the tags. The actual chips, as you can see, are quite small. And these can be embedded under the skin. Um, there's lots of privacy issues um, about uh, that certain groups have raised that uh, we and other people are struggling with to guarantee that people can't be tracked uh, without their knowledge. Um, but these are basically the, uh, the tags. So the thing that they bring is, is uh, information about what something is. There's an ID on the tag. And from that, um, you can look up in a database what it is and where you've got approximate information about that, basically from where the reader is located. Um, when, the timing, you've got time. And hopefully you've got why some information about the context. And one of the things that uh, we found that, that the data itself, just the read data, is pretty useless without the context. You need to know, OK, well, I've read this tag. What's it part of? Is, is this part of a, a case commissioning event? Or is it part of a shipping event? Or is it part of what, what is the context for it? And getting that data is not so easy. Um, in our case, we have to go to ERP systems, you know, like SAP to get that data. We need some kind of hook into that data, like a PO number or something. Um, and so raw, raw data about um, just a, a tag read is not that useful. This uh, slide is taken from Nokia that uh, believe that RFID embedded in cell phones, which they have now, um, can have what they call a handshake. And based on that handshake, you can exchange information. Um, you can maybe uh, do contactless payments, etc. Uh, so the cell phone industry is very excited about, well, about a number of things. Um, but one of them is RFID and short, short range communication. Um, and the space that we live in, uh, you know, obviously there's Wi Fi, all the other uh, standards. But RFID lives in the, in the space of very, very s small data rates, low, low bandwidth. Um, Typically, they, a, a chip will do maybe 800 calculations, and that's about all it can do before it shuts down. Um, so it can't do very smart things. Um, yeah, question? 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit, what kind of calculation? Uh, these are 32-bit. Yeah, yeah, T typically. Um, these are the kinds of um, application areas. Uh, obviously logistics, but also contactless payments is a big area. Near field communication um, is obviously uh, very interesting. Keyless entry, um, retail distribution, proximity services, as I mentioned, in cell phones. Um, actually, the Nokia cell phones now contain something like 11 different aerials. That they've got Bluetooth, 802.11. So, you know, we're using them in robotics as basically communication centers. Um, but they've got RFID now as well. Um, so, um, the things that we're particularly interested in is secure supply chain. Um, we've done quite a bit on anti-counterfeiting. That this, this actually counterfeiting is, is a, a severe concern in some verticals. Um, certainly in the, in the area of the pharma industry. Um, livestock tagging, pharmaceuticals, as I say, hospital passports. Um, these are some of the examples of projects which, uh, this is the Korea lab where they've uh, put sensors in the mountains that in, in South Korea that mountaineering is, uh, or hill walking is very popular. Uh, they've placed sensors so that you can, you know, sit in Seoul and uh, look at what the mountain weather is today. And so that probably is something interesting to you guys in sensor maps. Um, as I mentioned, uh, near field communication um, is working in the same bandwidth. Uh, the high frequency band is 13.56 megahertz. The ultra high, uh, ultra high frequency, um, 800 uh, to 900 megahertz. Um, I thought I'd just do a quick demo. Um, like most things now, uh, stuff is becoming much cheaper. And uh, this is a company called Fidgets, uh, manufactures lots of robots parts, and they also do an RFID kit. Um, and I'll pass around these tags. I'll see if I can get this to actually work. Um, there's a little uh, program here. Let's see if it's enable or enable, maybe just enable. Is that, is that Fidget's PH? PH. Is the old research project from Calgary? I don't know. I hadn't heard of that one. 
Is that a spin out? Maybe. Is the spin yeah. out? Is it those yeah. Guys? yeah. Yeah. So um, let's just take take a tag and hopefully no, as usual, it doesn't read it. Hmm. Okay. Oh, hang on, guys. Huh. Well, still doesn't read it. Okay. Never do a live demo. I'll, I'll see if I can get that working. Maybe uh, for some reason. Let me just kick it up once more. It should... Uh, Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I think, I think what happened was I had two tags stuck together. And they, um, this actually il illustrates one of the problems. That if all the tags talk back at the same time, um, the, the reader can't pick out the signal. And so it needs, you need smart readers. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about Gen 2 readers. Um, some of the concerns... Um, with passports, they're putting RFID tags in passports with the idea that when you shut the passport, the, the tag can't be read. Um, the problem is that if they're slightly open, they can be read. So there's a concern that... Yep, question. The problem is also but the passport, the passport is open, it can be read by old barcode technology, so it seems like a totally useless idea. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, in, in some ways, there's nothing... There's n RFID doesn't bring you... What it brings you is the, uh, that you can read... A, without line of sight. But in, that's the you problem. That the passport rules. Yes, you can do. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the case of some of the, it's interesting, in, uh, with some of the technology, the fact that it doesn't work at a great distance is an advantage. Um, in security areas, there's uh, some tags called, um, um, what's it, not, not Bluetooth, Ruby, Ruby tags. The, the field drops off very quickly, and that's an advantage, so that you know that it can't be read outside a certain distance. Um, these tags, it depends uh, how, f depends, you know, the surroundings. You can get up to 30 foot, even with some of these. Um, Nokia claim that they can read at quite a, quite a good distance. Um, they're getting Bluetooth to go over four kilometers. So... And, and they, they claim 40 kilometers for Wi-Fi. So uh, like well, it's, 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 yeah. They have the power generator hooked up directly to there. Exactly. The exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the new atomic powered cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, the idea with supply chain is that, that we get added visibility into what's happening to the products as they move through the supply chain. So that they'll be read as they enter a facility, uh, possibly read within the facility and read when they're being shipped out of the facility. Um, so that's what we'd like to happen, um, and I'll explain what we can do and what we can't do. Um, RFID, usually people think of, well, I always think of it as passive, but there's active RFID, obviously. Um, and even with active and passive, you can have sensors embedded in these. So, for example, the cold chain, um, it's critical that you know the temperature that the product has been at. And they're talking now about extending the sell-by dates if you can show that it's been kept at a certain temperature. Um, and 30% uh, of um, fresh produce is thrown away in this country uh, because of the sell-by dates. Um, so the electronic product code, it's uh, with the barcode, you had a company prefix and an item reference or, or a SKU, so you knew what the product was, but individual products weren't identified. Um, the idea with the EPC code is that there's also a serial number, so you've got a unique identification of every product. Um, so typically they started off with 64-bit tags, 96-bit are pretty common now, 128, you can get e even much longer ones, and you've got them with user memory as well now with the Gen 2 tags. Um, so typically, the binary on the tag, it's represented in binary in, in, in uh, some way. Um, however, in the software, it's represented as a URI or a URN. Uh, so we're dealing at, at my level with the URNs. And you've got the ability to have different 
This is an SG tin. Uh, DOD have got their own uh, here. So there's the ability to issue um, different uh, codes, if you like, or different uh, uh, generations, uh, subdivisions of the codes for different uh, purposes. Um, part of the problem with readers is that multiple readers read the same tags. The same tag will be read multiple times, so you've got to do some filtering. Um, if you've got uh, a palette that contains lots of tags, then you can't have the tags all talking back at the same time, and you have to go through this process of singulation, telling tags to keep quiet. And the Gen 2 uh, tags uh, allow this. Um, typically, they'll lay out benchmark tags in facilities so that they know where, they're, what they're re where they are. Yep. So on the, the previous slide, the URNs that you're using, obviously you need to have some somebody you need to go to with that. So, so do they have a big database that they can ask for what those tags are? Or what does yes, mean? yes. So, so the way it works is that a company will be given the will be given a company prefix, and then they can issue tags under that prefix. Right. Yep. So you have so, a two-step resolution. You need to know what the prefix is first. Right. right. So you go and get the resolution of the yes. prefix, and then you go to that. Yes. Thing. Yes. Well, and that's part of the problem is... Well, we, it's just a number. Oh, it's just a number. It's not a, right. It's just a number, but then it has to be given meaning. And in fact, part of the problem is that you've got these numbers attached to products, but also when you aggregate them into a palette, the palette itself will also have a number. So you've got so the hierarchies. You've got item. You've often got um, like with cigarettes. You've got a carton. Then you've got a case of cartons, and then you've got a pallet of cases, and etc. So you've got this hierarchy. And that's mapped into the hierarchy of the names. No. No, that needs to be built somewhere else. So, at the moment, there are. Uh, well, let me just get back onto this. Um, so, for example, this, this is typically what you've got now. You've got uh, GTINs, global trade IDs. You've got for containers. You've got serial shipping container codes. Um, you've got global returnable asset IDs. You've got all these numbers that have to be somehow mapped into a single electro electronic product code, um, and they've, they've done a number of these. They haven't done all of them. And actually, it's an interesting area. This idea of mapping into a larger space all these subspaces. You know, potentially you could map all these, for example, into IPv6. This brings up another interesting question, which is you mentioned context before, that, that all of these, you know, sort of events that are being triggered here, all these RFID events, yeah. you know, have to exist in some context. Yes. Are they aware of the context that they exist in, or is this something that happens totally at the back end in some data processing system? It's got to happen by some other channel. So, for example, that if you're kind of fulfilling a PO, You'll say, I'm fulfilling this PO. Now, all these reads that happen after this are associated with this PO. And so, so, so this is... The, so you don't have data getting pushed at the tags. The, 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 uh, there may be data going to the readers. But yes, perhaps. yes. The way I view it is the reader is like a sensor, that the, that the reader is gathering information and about its environment, which are the tags, and then that's pushed somewhere. And you need some other context. Somebody's got to say, yep, this is part of this PO. How far and then. Is sort of the physical hierarchy does the context go? Does it go all the way to the reader of the RFID tag? Or, or no, typically it, not. It doesn't go that far. No. Okay. No. It, it typically goes to a server, and we have yeah. an RFID server group mm -hmm. that you can talk to, and they can tell you a lot about how that works. Okay. Yeah. And then, and then you can reassign, for example, you could have a reader to a receiving dock and a shipping dock and later reassign one of them and say, okay, this is no longer receiving, now it's shipping. So it's in the server that the meaning is all happening. Yeah. But that's kind of critical, and that's something that, you know, isn't thought about often, um, that you need this context, and that's what gives it business value. And to some extent, um, managing these events and understanding that you'd say haven't got a full palette needs to trigger some kind of event, and specifying what these events are is not that easy. Um, so these are some of the codes uh, that um, are mapped uh, by this tag data standard. Um, 
Aggregation events, as I say, you've got this hierarchy that somehow you need to capture so that you know what it is that the fact that you're reading a palette, you should recognize that, yes, it's a palette and that it maybe should contain things. So the typical uh, supply chain scenario is, is that you're manufacturing something. As it leaves, it'll pass through the readers. Um, it'll go to a freight forwarder, to a carrier, across the, the ocean, uh, to a customer. Um, at the moment, you've got lack of on-time shipment completion information. You don't know that you've got all the parts ready. Um, there's a problem with, uh, in pharmaceuticals with totes. So typically a tote is, ju is just um, a carton that you throw lots of different drugs into um, and that you've got to recognize exa exactly what's in that tote. Um, so let me just, so this is um, EPC's global, or so the standards bodies view of how this will work, that you've got the uh, protocols for at the reader level, um, you've got standards uh, for the middleware and something called the EPC information server. And so that would be the top level it, within an enterprise, that it'll have this EPC information server that from outside the enterprise you can query. Um, there's something called the object naming service that's, that is somewhat of a placeholder that is unclear what the... The idea was that if you had an EPC code, you could go to the object naming server and it would point you to a system, an IP address of a system, an, I, an EPCIS system that would know about that tag. Um, it turns out that that just simple mapping like DNS does isn't sufficient. You need authorizations and that's a complication. I'll, I'll explain a little bit about um, that. The secure supply chain is, is, is of great interest at the moment. Um, a number of states have implemented uh, what they call pedigree laws, saying that drugs must be tracked because uh, there's a lot of counterfeiting going on. It's unclear actually how much. In this country, it's probably about 1% or less of the drugs are, are counterfeit, but in Africa, it's, up, it's more like 20%. Um, so you've got countries like Mexico, India, China that are producing these drugs. Often they're not meant to be counterfeit, but people see the opportunity. Um, often, for example, in China, China will re-engineer. The fastest way to improve your manufacturing is to re-engineer a product. You know, so you take Gillette razor blades, re-engineer them. Um, but then somebody says, oh, I could, I could take these and sell them in Europe. And so they get exported as uh, counterfeit. So you've got two problems. Basically, you've got um, the authentication problem. Is it a, is it a genuine product? And then um, the actual pedigree problem of, you know, has it, has it uh, gone through the, right, through the right steps in the supply chain? Um, these are some of the uh, seizures in 2004. We had a, a, a student do a PhD, uh, Torsten uh, Starkey is probably now the, the expert on counterf or counterfeiting. Um, companies have talked to him where they won't talk to each other. <laughs> um, so he actually has got probably some of the best data. If you look it up on the web, you'll get numbers like 5% in the US of things are counterfeit. But he doesn't believe that. It's more like, it's somewhere less, less than one he believes. But, but it's increasing, that's for sure. Um, and you can see that these are not high value items. Things like tea bags, uh, you know, Coke, Campbell's soup, um, batteries, Duracell batteries, uh, Michelin tires. I think they seized 40,000 Michelin tires in France um, that were counterfeit and come from China. Um, so this is a real problem, and it's a problem that's not being talked about much. The drug companies in particular will just, if they hear that there's counterfeit, they'll just go and buy them back and just cover it over because... They certainly, they certainly don't want to raise uh, any panic about the supply chain. So with product authentication techniques, uh, I mean, these, these aren't so easy. Um, so the idea here is that, well, you could, you could copy EPC codes. You know, if, if there's an EPC code, this is a product, I can copy that EPC code and put it on the counterfeit. I can program the tag. However, Tags also have a built-in tag ID, so by combining that, it just makes it more difficult that you'd have to somehow manufacture the chip itself. Um, so if, if you 
if you had the ability to, to move information both ways, you went, you could actually have individual consumers when they're interested in buying a product that they want to know if it's counterfeit. Basically, do a check, have it go back and look at the provenance of the object in some database, and then come back and say, is it reasonable to expect that that product should be in that location? Right. You know, with that idea, uh, that ID, and that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, that's the idea. Um, sorry, another question. Yeah, do you have to have a manufacturer? Because a chip, you can pretend to be a company and buy chips and then play around with them. Sure, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that typically, these counterfeiters have a lot of money. I mean, they're business people. They're business people. Um, and one of, the, one of the conclusions, actually, of uh, Torsten's thesis is that, you know, you don't have to totally defeat the counterfeiters. All you have to do is make their business unprofitable. Yeah. So you have to just, by, by making it, you know, if you seize 10%, then their business is unprofitable. Even, so it doesn't have to be a perfect defense, like most security things. Um, you know, you're, you're in an escalating game. Um, but certainly companies, for example, the cigarette companies, you know, seize container loads of uh, cigarettes that are counterfeit. And they go to great lengths. They'll put on these, uh, these matrix barcodes that contain quite a lot of information. And that information may be encrypted with different levels of, um, of security so that, for example, passport uh, um, customs people can read certain parts of it. Um, but as they, as they quickly point out, that the customs people are often bought off by the counterfeiters. There's enough money in this game. So it's very difficult to protect passwords. Um, so um, the idea of <coughs> somehow uh, specifying or identifying objects um, by their properties is, is an interesting area. That, for example, is there, could I scan the actual material of this and come up with some kind of spectrum that I could then encode that would, that, that would basically tie the tag to this actual product. That you could then read the tag, scan the actual product yourself and see if these match um, and that would ensure that the authenticity of the product. Um, so there's a lot of patents actually uh, out already on, in that area. And in fact there was a researcher here at Microsoft that was producing, I think, by putting, yeah, putting random wires. Yeah. 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 Well, it's, uh, it's you know, plastic. the idea who figured out how, make, how to make license plates for Russian ICBMs, and then a guy, Yu Chun Chen here, picked up from him. Oh, is how that right? Cheap? Yeah. Because ICBMs are expensive. Yeah. And the, se the first guy assumed that the Soviet Academy of Science is a bad guy, so he was really serious. And Yu Chun is also really serious, but he's talking $500 work copies, copies of Office. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. The, the, there's actually an, a, a category of that research that I came across when I was reviewing a paper long ago for a conference. Physical something something. And and so what we did was an example of that, but there are other techniques also applicable to RFID for looking at other physical characteristics of the tag and then encoding that into the into the data. Oh the, yeah. Look at the physical characteristic of the product, and then encoding it in the tag, yeah? Well, what we did was about the tag characteristics. Oh, oh okay. Okay. But we'll you have to encode the product. Yeah. I mean, just yeah. any, you know, take a, yeah. If you take any measurable dimension of something, you, yeah. you can put, yeah. put that into... Yeah. And you expect the counterfeit to be different from the real product? I mean, the counterfeit know how to make counterfeit. That's why it's watches, but an idol. Yeah, I mean, the pro the, the, right, the problem is they're made uh, on the same assembly line sometimes at night. You know, they'll run an extra... Uh, you know, shipment of tailor-made golf clubs or whatever it is. Um, the, the pharmaceutical industry at the moment is, what is one of the main drivers uh, for RFID in, in that a number of the states have passed uh, pedigree laws. Um, the two that are, that are, there's a number of states considering them, the two states that have passed them are California and Florida. Um, and so by 2009, um, pedigree has to be, the, they've said, that's, that's going to be law. Um, so the pharma companies now uh, have to figure out how that pedigree is going to be done. Uh, California said that it must be done, in, done di digitally. Florida says that it can be done, the pedigree can be done with paper. So that, in, in the sense that have they really kind of nailed down a pretty, pretty hard thing to get around or, or is it? No, they just said that this is what we want to happen. 
how you do it now is go, go do it. Um, so what the industry is now doing is, is, is trying to figure out uh, and uh, the, so the pedigree um, or the proposal, let's, there's an e-pedigree standard just come out of EPC Global. Um, so basically all that happens is that you put certain information about that I, I made this drug, it was uh, this run, it contained these products, and then you sign it, uh, digitally sign it. And then goes to the next person, and like an onion, they put the next wrapper of skin around it, and you have this document going through the supply chain. Now, that's, it sounds quite good, except that, you know, in Florida, you've, you've got something like 10,000 CVS stores at this end. And so the pedigree, uh, you know, I've got this carton of stuff or this pallet, and it gets split up and split up and split up, and each one has to have a separate pedigree. So you've got a lot of documents that are going to be pushed around. Um, and the, at the moment, it's unclear where these are going to be stored. That will they be willing to store them in some third party? You know, VeriSign has come along and said, oh, we'd be happy to take care of storage of these documents. Yeah. And IBM have said the same thing, you know, and, and I'm sure Microsoft would come along and say, you know, you know, yeah, we've got plenty of servers. Yeah, but the, but, but the drug companies themselves and there's certainly people like CVS say, no, no, we, we want to physically have those documents or digitally have them, you know, that we're not willing to trust that you have them. But that seems to be exactly the, the, the issue with the trustworthiness. It's not necessarily of the text, it's about who says what about them. Yes. As a part of the resolution. Yes. Um, so everybody yeah. who are in the resolution chain has to be uh, trusted by whoever wants to make some, say something about them. Yes. That, well, that's part of the problem, right? That if, so that's one of the questions. If I, if I receive this document, do I just have to check this last guy? Do I have to just trust him? Or do I have to trust everyone else? And do I have to check on everyone else? What am I responsible for? Or can I, so that, that's, being, uh, that's being sorted out at the moment. Um, so this, this is one of the, so there's lots of use cases out there. So this one is, is a typical use case. Um, so you've got a, a number of manufacturers, say let's have two here, and they manufacture two products each. So they go through the supply chain, distributor, distributor, retailer. So this retailer one receives this type one and three, and this one two and four. Now, let's suppose this retailer makes a query back to this manufacturer and says, tell me about EPC code SKU1. The manufacturer has no way of knowing if they received that product or not. And so this, this, is, this, this is one of the problems. Does the manu how does the manufacturer know whether they should answer that query? Because there's actual value in knowing who's, how many products have been shipped by so-and-so, how many products have been sold. At the moment, in the, in the pharmaceutical industry, the retailers sell that information back up to the manufacturers. Um, and what this means is that we have, to either, we have to figure out some kind of security tokens. How does the, how does the retailer prove that they've got that EPC code? Now, the trouble with the EPC codes is they're not from a, a large enough space that you could guess EPC numbers. So you need maybe some other number, you know, typically that, like when you do with software, you put a registration number that's so large that you couldn't guess it. So that would tell me, yes, you really do have my product. Yeah. I think 28 IFC would have to have a very sparse space if the bureaucracy didn't insist on having serial numbers. I mean, if you just have random no, yes. Even if you've only 64 bits <laughs> left, you can scatter the numbers all over the place. Right, but then you've got a problem of how do you issue them? Randomly. Well, well, as long as it's a big space, you could do it like GUIDs. Yeah, right. But at the moment, they want, it, they want some way. They decided on hierarchy. And, mo and actually, most numbering systems have hierarchy. Yeah. That you, you, they're, they're not just random. Mm -hmm. So typically, you'll find that there is that hierarchy. And, and that's what they have at the moment. Um, but th this means that we need some way of authenticating a query, and we don't know how to do that at the moment. Um, so this is one approach that, let's suppose, 
this company makes a query and says, I want to know who's, who's got information about this EPC. So they say, well, let's have a, let's have a trusted third party up here we'll, that, that'll run a registry. And everyone that touches the EPC X will put a, a piece of data up there saying, ah, I saw that. So these guys put it up there. Company D doesn't put it up there. But at least this third party could possibly then answer this question. Now, this, this guy has got the problem of, does this company have the authority to ask that, that question? Now, it means we need business rules. And it means we need business rules attached to, if he's asking about this EPC, the business rule is per EPC, which means that we've got to have a heck of a lot of business rules. Um, and it's unclear how that can be built. So that's... But that, that approach is Sorry. very typical of EPC Global because they're in the business of licensing uh, the central authority. And, and so their approach to everything is based on central authorities. Whereas the well, approaches that would say company A attaches a code, you know, an external security code, Company B attaches its own code. Now, Company C gets the composite of that. And there are other local approaches yes, that yes. don't involve central registries. But EPC Global isn't in the business of promoting them. Well, they actually aren't going to run these registries. No, but they're going to make a bundle from VeriSign or whoever does. Well, it's, it's may, maybe, maybe. Um, I mean, EPC Global is, is 12 guys. That's all that's there. Well, so they, they certainly can't run these things. That, you're, you're right. The GS1 organization wants to make money from issuing EPC the, codes. Big companies will be paying them tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars per year for the licensing for EPC Global Manager. They like, they, they maybe like that, but I, I, I'm not sure that's going to play out like that. But, but what, whatever. Um, it, anyway, that's the central approach. Is what I'm saying. And there were other distributors. Well, there's a well. This, this is that there would be registries. That's why I put registries. It's not that there'll be one registry because, for sure, China is not going to agree to VeriSign. And they've, they've stated that pretty forcefully. So there's, there's, it's, it's, a, it's a tough problem. But the idea of having a third party, a trusted third party, uh, if you don't have a trusted third party, how is the system going to work? Because you, so, because you have a trust mechanism that can be established between the companies. Um, I, I, we'll talk about it. But it's not so easy to do that. It's not so easy in, in that they don't trust each other. This guy. First, this guy may not know who this guy is. They don't know about each other, even. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it is. It's um, so, and in some ways, getting your hands around that, that there's no such thing as a, s a static supply chain. That these things are very dynamic. That you know, companies come and go. Um, and then this comes back to the need, you know, so Kim Cameron identities, uh, which make it clear that. You know, identities are sets of claims that we need to understand what are the security tokens that should exist in these supply chains. We don't know at the moment. We haven't got them. They haven't been sorted out. We don't even have standardized roles. We don't, they aren't agreed on. Yeah. He's one of your guys. Yeah, he's an architect. He's, a he's, he's architect your architect of... Active Directory and InfoCard. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. yeah. He wrote famous paper, Laws of Identity. We said, look, we, there, there should be some laws here. And one of them is, you know, you give away the, the least information that you need to in order to get the, the permissions. That, you know, if you uh, ask me, am I over 18, I don't tell you my birthday. I just have some card that shows, yes, I'm over 18. You know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't give away too much information. He has a great big blog also. Yeah, I yeah, blog. yeah. Okay. We, we, had, we had an interesting... Um, <coughs> One in the, in, so the, the point is this, that roles aren't agreed upon. We don't have a, some standardized roles yet in, in supply chains. Um, and we had an interesting case of iLabs, which uh, this was funded by Microsoft, um, that, uh, part, part of iCampus. And so the idea is well, we put labs online. And so at MIT, we put a number of labs. One of them was the electrical lab and that we were going to share these with other universities. And we, Harvard was one of the ones that we were testing with. And so 
The problem was, okay, we don't know about the Harvard students, so Harvard would issue security tokens. They'd say, okay, Fred is an instructor and therefore should have these permissions on these labs. Or Fred is, you know, a student or Fred is a professor or whatever. And, but the problem was that Harvard also didn't know about the MIT labs, about the resources that we're giving, giving access to. And it turns out that we had a nuclear reactor that was a lab, and they had, you know, Osama bin Laden's relatives in Harvard. And so what was just a very, you know, low-level security problem turned into something that we hadn't realized was quite serious. Um, and this, this problem of standard, people understanding what roles mean and what the resources even are. Um, and in supply, in supply chain it comes up with, so the EPC code could be attached to cornflakes or it could be a cruise missile. And you don't know. And so, so that's one area. <laughs> so what we're doing is we're trying to figure out what this network will look like. And we're focusing on, on these areas. How, how are we going to handle this security? How are we going to make it scalable at the same time? And also extensible in that we'd like to extend this from passive RFID to include sensor data because there's a lot of, in the cold chain we have temperature data. So it's a natural extension. So we'd like to try and figure that out. Um, we're, we're writing our simulator based on, uh, we're using the CCR which I think is a brilliant bit of, uh, brilliant library. Um, the Robotic Studio DSS uh, to give us some kind of um, granularity to building higher to, to building hierarchies, if you like, um, and we're using Link or uh, XNA, and I'll, I'll show you some of the stuff. So this is the uh, this, these are the standards that are in place at the moment, and we've implemented uh, most of this stack. Um, just the way that readers talk to tags is actually quite sophisticated. As I say, this singulation process, and so those standards, they're probably about 100 pages. Um, the application layer events, so this is that I've read these tags and we've already done filtering, so we've only got you know, one read of each tag. So th this is the AL uh, standard. Um, so this is a schema. And the same with EPCIS, that we've got a query, a capture interface, and then we've got a query interface that we say, okay, this is the way to query about EPC codes, and this is the way to respond. Yeah. So um, uh, back in the few years ago when I was working with EPC Global, uh, there was a reader protocol and reader management spec. Yes. Which was an alternative to LLRP. At that time, LLRP hadn't been picked up by EPC Global. Right. And, and, and then those two were combined, I think, into the reader operations. And that's where I sort of stopped working. With um, Did that ever happen? No, no. What's, what we, um, what's the current status of... The current status is that, that the reader protocol looks like it'll um, probably just disappear. That really? LLRP, low-level reader protocol, wow. um, is probably more successful as being accepted by more companies. Um, it'll probably be extended upward yeah. that low-level read protocol can, it, it tells you how you talk to your readers and it tells your readers, okay, you know, do this, do that, switch on, switch off. Um, the um, ALE itself may disappear. But it's that unclear. Was, that overlapped a lot with the reader protocol. Yes. And they were going to try yes. to unify those. Yes. There was a, um, there was a, I, I sit on something called the, uh, the ARC, the Architectural Review yeah. Committee, and we had a, a, a number of meetings recently about these protocols that were overlapping. It all sounds like it's pretty much a state of flux. It's, it was, yeah, I think it's fairly result, yeah, it's a state of flux, yeah. So if yeah. fairly goes away, what would replace it? Probably uh, LLRP will be extended far oh, enough up that you don't right. need, that you don't, there's a lot of stuff in, in AL that you don't need, yeah, yeah. These, in some, I'll talk a little bit about these standards because uh, I have some opinions on them. EPCIS was just approved, um, and so we've developed an open source version of this. It's available, uh, you can hit it at this uh, um, address. And we've got a server running that you can, 
oh, no, I can't query. I don't have permissions. Okay. Well, you guys can do it. Um, we've, we've got a server running that you can hit. Um, and actually, that's going to be a problem. I can't demo some of the stuff. Okay. One, one of the questions and why we're interested in um, Robotic Studio is that it provides probably what we need at this middleware layer, that it provides, for example, forwarder services to be able to forward messages. Um, it provides some uh, discovery mechanism of services, that you've got directories, uh, directory of the services that are registered with it. Um, some of these others that are needed. Master data is, at the moment, master data um, is data about the product. So I've got the EPC code. Now the EPC code is on a, you know, a packet of uh, cornflakes. And this would describe, the master data would describe the box, the weight, all the data about that product. And that's stored and, um, in a central place. And uh, there's a service that everyone's agreed uh, to support that actually serves up that data, that master data. And we can talk a little bit about the problem of master data because it's a, it's a real issue within companies that companies don't run just one ERP system. Like we were doing some consulting for a company and it had 24 SAP systems. And within those, there was no standardization that they had the same data in different SAP systems and didn't know it. So for example, that they, you know, they had the name and address of a company that they were selling to and the address might be slightly different, they, those SAP systems wouldn't be coordinated. Uh, and they typically get that by buying companies. You know, they'll buy a company, they come with an SAP system, and it costs too much to rationalize the two. Um, so that there's, there's lots of issues um, in this space. What I'd say is that I know that Microsoft is coming out with ERP products now, and it's probably a good time because... Are you aware of our RFID server? I've heard of it. I'd like to talk to you about it. I don't know what it, uh, what it does. Uh, I, um, hopefully, someone from that product group will be coming okay. in the follow-on meeting. Yeah. If, but if not, I'll tell you a little bit about it tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, and, and that's different from the CPCIS lookup. You know, we also will have components to do G10 and EPCIS yeah. lookup as part of our larger enterprise architecture. Well, all this data is going to cause issues for people like SAP, that their, their databases are not set up to handle this kind of low-level data. So their, their strategy is to push it off into a separate database and have hooks between the two. Um, I can, we're, we're funded by SAP, so I, we're, <laughs> we're breaking our back on SAP systems at the moment. Uh, I guess something like 30 or 20, yeah, 30,000 tables in their database. So it's, they know an awful lot about process, I'll say that. What do your insert rates look like? What do your insert rates look like? I mean, you're how much a, data? Yeah, like, I mean, how many data, how many, how many times per second are you trying to put stuff in the database? We did a calculation for somebody like Walmart, and they'll, they'll be something like 20 gigabytes a day. Okay, but in terms of the number of times that you sort of are asking, that you're kicking it, that you're asking it to respond to you. Well, we don't know because these systems are not, I mean, we're only just doing demonstration systems at the moment. There's very, so, very few systems that are operating. So when you talk about that data rate, you said 20 gigabytes a day. Is That's that just a rough every, estimate. Is that assuming every read goes all the way up to the database? Or is that assuming that you have yes. filtering on the reads? No, no, that's assuming that there'll be one, that, well, so instead of having a hundred reads that this doesn't go ding, 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 right. they'll be filtered down to one. So there'll but be not one. Business event filtering. Not business event filtering, right. right. So, so the RFID server at Microsoft is based on the idea that after you do that filtering, you then do business event filtering yeah. so that you only hit the database yeah. for the significant events. Yeah. yeah. So but yeah, I think it's, we're probably looking at maybe hundreds of thousands of events per second, millions even maybe. Oh, well, I, I think they're looking at much lower rates. Much than lower that. rates than that. Yeah. See, so it de but depends. But, uh, those guys have a, a lot of numbers, okay. so yeah. they can tell you what their assumptions are about, you know, a model of a warehouse and how many reads per I second. Mean, yeah, I don't know how many pallets go in and out of dockers. Yeah. I mean, not at a rate of hundreds of thousands of pallets per second. So yeah. no, but you, you, you may you may use them inside factories though. So so people use them to to understand what what's happening in their process and their manufacturing, and they'll have millions of reads. So, so it depends. I wouldn't think of it as just shipping things out of a dock door. 
You know, you have, may have RFID tags within a factory. Yeah. So, the so they'll the be... point, I'm guessing, is not up to that level of, of data rate. I, I mean, mean uh, undoubtedly, you'd like, to, you'd like to do smart things and, and recognize events in the data. And so we're, we're doing a fair amount of research on machine learning to try and understand what's going on. But it's not that easy. Uh, we built a model of just what happens in, um, with, store, uh, with, with shelf replenishment in, for Walmart. And even that is a complex model. Um, we, we don't have a, a great grip. So my sense is that this, there's a lot of work to be done yet in this, in, in this layer up here. I mean, this is where all the money is going to be made in the analytics. Um, and that's certainly one of the issues is, is return on investment here. But in terms of things that you guys are looking at in that space, I mean, are you guys looking at, at you know, sort of the data processing, you know, kind of aspect yeah. of it? Yeah, stream for, stream, yeah, we want to be able to process streaming data. Okay, so are you, yeah. are you using, are you talking about Mike Stonebreaker or those guys? Uh, we know them, we know them, yeah, yeah. Are you, are you yeah. using their... Their stuff or no, we're not using their stuff. Uh, SAP is talking to them for sure. I know it's always one of the areas they're interested in. You know, uh, how do you how do you coordinate across different data streams? Yep. Yeah, how do you correlate? Yep. But it's not it's not that easy. Um, you know, we've got tons of data from from Walmart and trying to understand it is not easy. Um, usually, it comes without unfortunately without context. You know, it's like most things. Uh, so um, what we're trying to do at the moment is we'd, we'd, we'd like to span active and passive sensors. And I, I, I obviously didn't finish that slide. Um, but we're, we're looking at some kind of, we'd like some building block um, where we've got some services that can be leveraged. Um, what we're doing, so we, 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 love, we love the port model in uh, in, in Robotic Studio, I don't know if you're all familiar with that, but it's, it's, a, it's a great abstraction, I think, to be you know, putting data on ports and having very simple data that you can have a chance of processing in your streams. Um, so th and we view a reader, for example, uh, as, as, as a sensor. It's a sensor that's just, they happen to be tag reads, but um, we, we kind of quite like that. And we can cast into this model uh, the whole of RFID that... We have, it doesn't matter how complex the data is, um, we, can, we can still handle it in the same model. Um, so within the DSS node, for example, we can build readers and reader managers as services pretty easily. And that was thanks to Heinrich. Uh, we, we, I've got a model of that. Um, and you know, we were worried about web services uh, originally for speed, but um, the speeds that we're seeing now are, are pretty phenomenal. Um, it'll get a lot faster. And I'll get a lot faster. Good. Okay. No, but they're, 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 they're certainly. Uh, you'll have to tell me how they, how they, you know, what, what the technology is behind it. But um, they're certainly fast enough, and we can see that. So in Robotic Studio, this is nothing to. Well, it is to do with robots in the sense that we're going to set. We're going to sense things. We need to be able to make decisions about things. Then we need to take action. And that's basically what robots do. Um, they have a very tight control loop. In RFID, we have a very loose control loop that may take weeks. But it's the same thing. That if we can't make sense of the data, then we've got problems. So we need to be able to coordinate services. And I think that's the big thing that, uh, th that's one of the big problems, coordinating services. And we've got to be able to do it. So we see having we actually, uh, I had a guy that did a thesis and we came up with what we called a realm. Um, but it's very similar to the DSS. Um, and I think that you guys have implemented DSS better than we implemented our realm, so we're happy to switch to DSS. Um, but I think there's going to be other services that are not provided in the DSS that we need to add on. Um, but this would be just taking it up to the next level where We've got these reader managers, and we've got an EPCIS, and then we'd expose ourselves to the outside world in a, in a similar way through maybe a DSS kind of, kind of node. Um, we've got, a, as I say, a fair amount of code in place at the moment. We've got both, uh, we've implemented in .NET and MIT. We've got the same thing in Java. Um, so we've, we're covering both platforms, and we've got pretty much uh, 
uh, the whole stack at the moment. Um, and so this is our state. EPCIS was announced uh, on Monday, actually, as being approved. And so we've got our code out there. Uh, if you want to download it, um, we'd be happy to give it to you. Some of the challenges for this EPCIS infrastructure is how to do pub-sub. How, how the, in EPCIS, you're allowed to put triggers onto, I can ask you to look out for certain events. How those triggers are placed and how they're formatted, how we communicate those, uh, hasn't been figured out. Um, but, it, but it's an issue. And you can see that you better build caching into your system from the ground up, otherwise this thing is probably not going to fly too well. Um, like so, opportunity for worms and things to Yeah, do. yeah. Um, we're building a, a distributed EPCIS uh, system so we can guarantee that qu queries will be answered. Um, so the object naming service, it was interesting that, um, so the idea is that you'd like some service that takes you from you know, the EPC URN, if you like, or URI, that it'll, it'll take you to a, a, a URL, and from the URL you can get the IP address. Um, making that two-step process is actually pretty good, rather than just going straight to an IP address, uh, because China objected strongly. They got screwed on IPv4, um, and they just wouldn't buy into this ONS, and in fact, they built their own object naming service. So uh, um, their um, Chinese Academy of Sciences have built one for blood, blood tracking. Um, so we're collaborating with them, trying to bring them, well, bring, bring us both into the fold so that we don't uh, build something that's not uh, standardized across countries. So we're, we're putting a lot of effort into understanding how, how, this, uh, how the caching works, um, and as I say, building a distributed EPCIS. Um, th this is the, the, the schema. It's brutal. It's about it's 100. The EPCIS, all, my worry about this, the standards is that they came out of committees and they just threw everything in. And just to read these documents is, is tough sledding. If you haven't been on the work groups, you stand very little chance, I think, of understanding these standards. So that's a problem because it's not going to, this isn't going to work for in the home. You know, nobody's going to pick this up like HTML. Um, so we're, we're very worried about that. This is part of, this is our code base, you know, so we've got, these are our classes for each of the different queries that, that are allowed. There's 98 different queries. Um, so we've put a fair amount of effort into that. But we're worried because if you need this kind of, you know, IBM or Microsoft's engineering team to implement this, it's not going to scale. Um, so we look back at, you know, what, why, did, why did the web scale? HTTP was great. And so if you look at the standards on the web, you know, they're, they're pretty minimalistic. The, this, this is about, then we look at our standards, uh, and, you know, we've got 275 pages, 233, 180. So it's pretty clear that this is not going to scale. So we're, we're trying to come up with what we call, um, I'll, I'll come back to this, but scaling we think is a problem. Um, Zero pages might not be a positive, though. <laughs> Zero might not be a positive. But we think we can, we can build something. We've built um, a, a kind of REST interface to EPCIS. So it's just basically a URL that you just get the data as a URL. And we think that, that that's a much better way of going. If you look at the other, the other way, as I say, it's pretty brutal. So we're, we're building what we call RFID Lite, which is just a very lightweight standard RSS may be based. Um, so we've got an RSS extension for EPCIS. We can take the EPCIS standard and embed it as RSS, which we think is a lot more palatable. You know, just, it's just lists of things, so RSS should do fine. Um, right with, um, with MSRS in general, because I mean, the services are just yeah. in those states, so it's a very natural. We actually have a, a RSS service also now. Oh, really? OK, so we love that. OK. Yeah. As usual, one step ahead. Um, you know, we think it's scalable for a, for a million dollars. You could you could build a machine that you know would handle a lot of queries or requests a day. Um, so we've got a this you know our proposal. If a, we'd like to implement this as a kind of for the home, if 
the EPC standards are going to fly for the supply chain for sure. You know, you've got the Walmarts and the, of the world have got the, the heavyweight power. They can implement those standards. But for, for, the, for the home, and if we're going to kind of get, I think, a, a standard that's going to be scalable, we need something much lighter. And so that's why I'm interested in what uh, you're doing with the sensor maps, is, is some kind of lightweight standard that people, just like HTML, can, can go home and write themselves. And we think we can, you know, take, take this other stuff and wrap it up. So um, we built a, what we, you know, a toolbox just to, to make sure that we're not blowing smoke, that we've, we've done our homework, we, we, we're pretty familiar with, with the problem. Um, we'd like to integrate passive and, RFI, uh, passive and active sensors, uh, you know, and that's why I wanted to talk to Stuart um, to, to understand what your guys are doing. The, the coordination services um, are, are the critical ones that there's a lot of things that haven't been sorted out. As I say, how to place triggers, the, the, the format, the standards for these triggers. Um, and I think some of the, uh, I'm not sure the abstractions are all there. We've, we've got some, these are our abstractions, but they may, they may not be the greatest. Um, and so that's basically, um, this is the, the team that we've got. Um, I was going to show you, we have, we've got a demo online of what we call GeoEPC, which basically couples up virtual, uh, virtual Earth with, uh, um, for tracking EPCs. Um, so we've got that integrated. Um, we've got a, I'll do a little uh, demo if I can, of a game that we have built on uh, XNA. Let me see if I, where it is. Time's pushing. I'll, I can, I can, okay, okay, I'll just, uh, let me see if I can, um, I'm, th that's it, basically, let me, students, da, da, da. um, sorry, Uh, we're, 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 we're building robots. Uh, we've got a, a helicopter that we're trying to attach uh, an RFID reader to fly through uh, warehouses. So this is our, this is our 3D uh, game here. So, so this is the... Uh, I'm not too good at... Ooh. Sorry, I quit it. Sorry. There we are. Anyway, we can you can play with it. It's 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 XNA and uh, it, it it was it was fairly friendly. But we think there's a serious application for this in that we can get CAD models of people's warehouses um, and basically lay them out. And what we're doing is we're using this to actually generate um, algorithms to automatically fly these things around. Um, this one, it's got some physics in it. You'll see that it'll start reading codes as it goes past, if I get close enough. Yeah, see, it's reading codes now. Anyway, yeah, it's kind of fun, these guys. Uh, if it reads the code for an X-Wing, does it raise an alert? Uh, yeah, I'm sure it would. <laughs> one day. Uh <-huh. laughs> So I, I think I think that's uh, that, that's about all I wanted to to show you guys. So, so strong with this one. Thanks so much, John. Great.